Hey everybody, welcome back to Computers and Computations. Last week we saw that there were multiple different kinds of uh, characterization of computation that turned out to be equivalent. And this week we'll be discussing how this might provide evidence for the idea that um, every effective procedure is computable and we'll also discuss some related theses in this direction. So, hope you enjoy the lecture. So before I get going, I should clarify that there's been an awful lot of work done on the church chairing thesis and variants of the church chairing thesis or, or thesis closely related to it. And for this reason, I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but I hope I can give an idea of some of the core motivations for it and also some questions that we might go and look at in future research. Right, so let's just recap in order to build some motivation here. So last week we saw that many characterizations of computation are equivalent. So we discussed uh, abacus machines and we discussed characteriz the characterization of computation in terms of recursiveness and how these all turned out to be equivalent to Turing computation. So this motivates the idea that maybe the effectively computable functions just are exactly the Turing computable ones. Okay, good. So this is exactly the topic for this week. Now we'll be looking at the Church Turing thesis and we'll state it a bit more precisely in a little bit. This is the idea that every effective computational procedure is Turing computable or equivalently recursive. Church was more interested in recursive functions before they were, it was realized that they were um, equivalent to Turing computable functions. Okay, so here's what we'll discuss this week. Well, first, we'll start out with a bit of a discussion of um, effective procedures and computations and how this figures into the Church Turing thesis. In section two, I'll then talk a little bit about some uses of the Church Turing thesis, how it can pop up sometimes in um, mathematical work as well, being a, as well as being an analysis of computation. In section three, we'll then discuss maximality theses. These are very close relatives of the Church Turing thesis. And then in section four, I'll close with some questions about what makes these kind of theses interesting and what we want to do with them and how we might move forward philosophically speaking. Okay, so the notion of an effective procedure or computation in general occurs at several different levels. So as we saw in an earlier week, there was a historical development of the notion of precise algorithm or procedure that doesn't require any ing ingenuity that substantially predates Turing. Okay, so we can think of things like um, the work on the difference engine, for instance, by Babbage and Lovelace and others. Uh, we can think about the um, notion of an algorithm as it ap appears even in Greek, you know, ancient Greek thought. Um, so there was this pre-theoretic notion of what a precise procedure was, really a cluster of ideas about what be, could be done in principle following some rules uh, and given enough, enough time. Okay? But then we get something a little more precise, something more proto-theoretic, and this could be credited you know, with a lot of the early people working in this field, people like Turing and Church, to isolate the notion of an effective procedure. So this is still not a fully mathematical notion, but it is much, much more um, precise than this very general pre-theoretic idea. Okay, so what are we what are we going to say an effective procedure is? Well, an effective procedure M has a finite list of finite instructions, right? So I've just got my list of instructions, whatever they may be. Given that I 
uh, execute those instructions on an input without error, I will finish in finitely many steps, right? I'm going to say as well that it must be able for, for a human to carry it out unaided, assuming the human lived long enough and had enough work paper to, to uh, write working calculations on. And finally, it requires absolutely no ingenuity to execute. Okay, so we're just going to give the steps in such a way that an agent with no uh, with no ingenuity or no use of intellect or any sort of black box could execute. It's just pure calculation. And this is still something of an informal notion, right? I'm still talking about what an idealized human could do. So it's not fully formal yet. Okay, and then on the end, we have the kind of theoretical notions of computation. We've discussed things like Turing computable and recursive abacus computable, and so on. So I think this is an important thing when we're thinking broadly philosophically about the notion of computation, that um, it occurs on these different levels, and it's a concept that has developed throughout time. Okay, so now we've been a wee bit more precise about the notion of what an effective procedure is. We can state the church Turing thesis as the claim that any effective procedure, in the sense that we gave on the last slide, is Turing computable. Uh, that was Turing's part of the thesis or recursive church's part of the thesis. Okay. okay, so why might we accept this? I mean, maybe you just think it's an intuitively plausible thesis. Um, there has been a lot of work done on this, so I'm not going to be able to um, summarize or give the rough idea for all of it. But I do think the following three uh, have been especially influential. And these are also discussed on the Stanford Encyclopedia article on the church Turing thesis, if people want to look at it there. So these are, well, firstly, every function that we've come up with an effective calculation procedure before for, has also turned out to be Turing computable. So we can think of ourselves as going around and listing all the all the functions and checking if they're Turing computable. It turns out they are. We can give Turing machines for these functions. Okay, second consideration. Any effective methods we've come up with for combining functions or combining effective functions can be given Turing machine representation. So if you give me a way of bolting together two effective procedures, I can find a Turing machine that corresponds to that bolting together process in, in some sense, right? And a third factor is that all attempts to characterize effective computation are equivalent. So for instance, we have a uh, we looked at abacus computability, recursive functions, and there's a whole uh, plethora of other notions of computation that have been considered in the literature. And every time we try and come up with a plausibly new kind of computation, um, or new kind of effective computation, it turns out to be equivalent to Turing computation. Right? So these represent a cluster of ideas that are sort of like abductive style considerations, something like an inference to the best explanation. And it seems related to kind of prediction and confirmation type style ideas, if not specifically prediction and confirmation. I mean, we would expect, for instance, that if the church Turing thesis holds, right, that all attempts to characterize effective computability would turn out to be equivalent. Why? Well, if they're a, if they're a kind of effective computability and the church Turing thesis holds, then they should also be Turing computable. As it turns out, all attempts to characterize effective computation have turned out to be equivalent to Turing computability. So maybe you think this, even if it's not a sort of formal demonstration of the church Turing thesis, it's pretty good empirical abductive evidence for the truth of the thesis. Good. So that's some rough 
ideas of why we might want to believe the church Turing thesis. And I strongly encourage anyone listening to this to go away and think about whether those should be uh, convincing or whether you think the thesis is true. But before I go on and dig into a little bit more about what what kinds of other thesis we might be interested in and uh, why those might be interesting, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the uses of the church chairing thesis. Uh, so, I mean, the church chairing thesis is definitely philosophically and conceptually useful. Okay, I mean, philosophically speaking, we'd be naturally interested in this idea of idealized computation and uh, idealized effective procedure and the fact that it can all be brought under the umbrella of a formal mathematical idea, and in particular one as clean and simple as the idea of Turing computability, this is really, really interesting. Uh, you know, that in a sense you can condense down the whole, um, or according to the church Turing thesis, you can condense down all these kinds of effective procedure into just these... Uh, tiny little automata that can move right and left and change symbols. Okay. Very interesting, though, though, it also crops up and has something of an influence on the practice of mathematics and theoretical computer science. Okay, so how does this go down? Well, suppose I'm trying to show that a particular function is Turing computable or equivalently computable in any one of the uh, hundred ways that we've come up with that turn out to be all equivalent to Turing computable. Okay, so there are two options for me here, right? The first is the one that we've seen mostly in this course thus far. Uh, we've been dealing with simple functions, so we've only needed a few states um, but for more complicated functions, maybe I need to design what I've sort of in slightly silly style called a four bajillion state Turing machine. I just mean a Turing machine with lots and lots and lots of states and lots of complexity. And it might be very, very difficult to design. So that's one route I could take to prove that my function is Turing computable. Or I could just describe an effective procedure for calculating my function. Right, this can be somewhat informal. It just needs to be that uh, it requires, you know, with finitely many instructions and a finite amount of time and no ingenuity on the part of uh, the person implementing it, that they could do it. And then I just appeal to the church during thesis and I say, okay, therefore it's computable. Okay. So, this can act as both a um, way of just being an abbreviation for uh, details left to the reader in a mathematical proof. But I think there's a substantial question, and this has been looked at in some areas of the literature, as to whether or not it might be slightly more significant than this in certain contexts. So let's just look at a simple example of this phenomenon. So you might recall from the uh, lecture on historical accounts of computation that we looked at um, Eratosthenes sieve. Okay, so how did this work? This is the method for determining the primes uh, up to some number n, right? Okay, so what do we do? Well, we list the numbers from 2 to n on a list. We add 2 to a second list, and then we delete all the multiples of 2 from list 1. And then you go to the next number on the list, if any numbers remain. Uh, you take the smallest one, you delete all the multiples of k from that list and add it to the, the other list. And uh, then once you've run out of numbers, you halt. So this is um, this is the image of the sieve is us slowly sieving out the primes from the from the big list. Okay, but this here this is just the description of an effective procedure, right? 
I might say from this, well, then by the church Turing thesis, there's a Turing machine that will compute uh, compute Eratosthenes sieve for me, right? But if I wanted to show that this was actually Turing computable without the church Turing thesis, I would have to take the much harder road of actually giving, you know, writing down a Turing machine for that. And this is this is you know still quite a simple algorithm we're talking about here. And in fact, if you go to any computability textbook, computability theory textbook, or lots of books in uh, computer science, there's really heavy use of the church Turing thesis in the background. Uh, now, there's a question of how benign or necessary this use is. It might just be an invitation for you to um, go and do the details yourself. But it's certainly the case that it saves uh, a lot of a lot of ink and possible mathematical labor. One might think quite trivial mathematical labor if we're actually having to go and write down the descriptions for these machines to just assume the church Turing thesis and work with the much more fluid perspective of being able to describe effective procedures and then assume that they're Turing computable. A second important use of the church Turing thesis is exactly what you take the implications of the limitative results to be. So things like the Entscheidung's problem or the halting problem. Let's go with the halting problem for now. But if you think the church Turing thesis is true, there's no point looking for an effective procedure to calculate the halting function for Turing machines. Okay? If the church Turing thesis were false, then perhaps it's just a matter of our current failure of imagination that we haven't managed to come up with an effective procedure to tell us when any given Turing machine halts on uh, an arbitrary input. Maybe if uh, it's not the case that um, every effective procedure is Turing computable, we could come up with an effective procedure that uh, avoids the uh, the halting problem for Turing machines and is able to tell us whether particular you know whether a Turing machine halts on an input. So whether or not you take the Church Turing thesis to be true, this is going to have you know, really quite profound impl implications for what you think the upshots of the limitative results are. Okay, so maybe you're happy with the church Turing thesis and you think it's true, but you might wonder whether there is some notion of computable uh, that is not effectively computable. Okay, so remember we had this specification of um, what is effectively computable or an effective procedure that was proto-theoretic in some sense, but perhaps one thinks that the notion of compute computation in an idealized sense uh, goes beyond this, okay? And this gives us a, a close relative of the church Turing thesis, and this is the maximality thesis, okay? What does the maximality thesis say? So, that says that all functions that can be computed by machines, and I leave it open what machines are here, uh, are effectively computable. Now there are at least two interpretations we might give to the maximality thesis. And this has to do with the kind of modality that's packed into the phrase can be computed by a machine, okay? So for instance, um, we might interpret can be computed by a machine in this weak sense, what we'll call the weak maximality thesis. And that's when we interpret can be computed by a machine as is computable by a machine in a physically possible world. So this is where we keep the laws of physics fixed. Perhaps we uh, shift some conditions about the world. We allow more resources, perhaps in terms of 
uh, the amount of space available. We just increase the physical number of atoms in the universe that could be used as bits, for instance, or something like that. But we keep the laws of well, the laws of nature, the laws of physics, constant. Okay. There's a much stronger version of the maximality thesis that's where we take can be computed by a machine to mean can be computed by a machine in any possible world and we really you know let let your uh, notion of possibility run wild and come up with far more exotic kinds of machine good so i talked a little bit on the last slide about different notions of possibility and i thought i would just say a little more about this as this is something that philosophers talk about a lot so we can talk about things being possible in different ways okay so for instance i might say that something is practically possible so here's the actual world here this is the world at which i'm speaking to this computer now you are um, listening to my voice through your computer or phone or whatever you have and this is you know this is the world uh, as it is or a representation of the world as it as it actually is right but i could also talk about practical possibilities so i could have um uh started work on my slides um two days earlier and then i would have perhaps produced this video two days earlier so this is a notion of practical possibility I mean, we might think that the notion of physical possibility, something is physically possible if uh, it doesn't contradict the laws of physics. This is something weaker than practical possibility, let's say. So let's assume, for instance, that um, there's just not enough gold in the universe to create or create a sphere that's of gold that's 500 kilometers across. Okay might not be practically possible to create such a such a gold sphere right but it might be physically possible it doesn't contradict the laws of laws of physics if the resources available in the uh, universe had been different it might have been possible to have a gold sphere uh, uh, um, 500 kilometers across okay and then metaphysically possible is something weaker still so this is perhaps where you think fundamental principles about weight the way things are don't get contradicted um, so this is very much very much weaker still and you might be you might cash out the difference between um, the weak form of the maximality thesis and the strong form as the weak form is is asserting that we have to remain in the physically possible worlds whereas the strong form is saying look perhaps there's some notion of possibility out here might be metaphysical possibility might not be that uh we can also use to draw worlds from here to act as our or to contain our machines right now something that i thought might be nice to mention is that there's also recently been a bit of discussion about the idea of impossible worlds if you if you think that uh po possible worlds or modal space these worlds are somehow composed of sentences let's let's say they're kind of maximal descriptions of the way things might be then if you modify the logic a bit you can also consider worlds in which uh, let's say Gödel's theorem is false or all functions are Turing computable kinds of impossibilities that we think just can't happen but we could still analyze what goes on there not strictly relevant for what we're discussing now just some fun stuff that is being increasingly looked at in philosophy at the moment okay so aside from that uh, little easter egg the key thing we want to focus on is the idea of the weak maximality thesis being focused on physical possibility and the sorry the weak version uh, yes the weak version being focused on physical possibility whereas the strong version allowing us to 
go for more than just physical possibility. So here's a putative counterexample to the strong thesis, and this is the idea of an accelerating Turing machine. Okay, what's an accelerating Turing machine? Well, it's a Turing machine, but it takes half the amount of time to compute the next step. So our previous Turing machines, they had some discrete notion of time, and they could just do uh, one operation and would move uh, that same discrete amount of time each time. An accelerating Turing machine speeds up. So after, let's say, one unit of time, it computes one step. It takes half a unit of time to compute the next step. So we go to one and a half. It takes half that next uh, interval to compute one and three quarters, and so on and so on and so on. And it's sort of routine to show that after two moments of time, it will have uh, performed a hyper task. It will have computed, done, or after it will have done infinitely many steps, right? Okay, so there are things you can uh, compute with such an accelerating Turing machine uh, that are not effectively calculable, assuming the Church Turing thesis. Okay, so for example, we can cal calculate the value of the halting function using one of these machines. So, what do I do? Well, I just at the first time I have, so I'm given a Turing machine M and I've given some input for MX and I start, I just write a zero, right? In my first step of computation. Okay, and then I run uh, M on X, right? And I just wait and I wait and I wait and the Turing machine goes, oh, or the, the accelerated Turing machine goes off and then at some point, if M does indeed halt on X, it will halt, right? And that'll be somewhere in here. And then if it halts, I go back, right? And then to where I had originally written zero on the tape, I change that to a one, because we know it halts, right? But if it doesn't halt, by the time I get to uh, time two, it still will have not halted, and so my z original zero will remain on the tape. And so I'll have given a zero if um, the machine does not halt and a one if it does halt, okay? So there are things that you can compute with this kind of accelerating Turing machine that assuming the church Turing thesis are not effectively computable, okay? Now, why does this affect the strong thesis? Well, maybe you think that if we're really allowed this very unrestricted kind of possibility uh, this counts as a perfectly legitimate machine of some kind and so acts as a counterexample to the strong maximality thesis. Okay, so the weak version of the maximality thesis is much more plausible. The idea that any physically possible machine will allow you to, um, will uh, uh, only give you effective procedures or effective computation. There are some putative counterexamples that have been considered. I'm not going to consider them here. The restriction to physical possibility often means that you have to get really hands-on with the particular physical models. So we'll do things of like, we'll talk about, you know, we have some black hole and we talk about what happens as a computer falls into the black hole, for instance, and we have to give some very uh, complicated description of what the physical model we're working in looks like. So I think a consideration to bear in mind, though, that we can have as philosophers is whether or not physical possibility is a stronger notion than modeling physical theory. So just because I can give a particular model for a set of equations doesn't necessarily mean that we should automatically accept that as physically possible. Physically possible, it might, but that's a substantial philosophical thesis to say that any physical model counts as you know a perfectly good phys philosophical possibility, and this is this is. Um, extreme, you know, brought into sharp focus with the consideration in the philosophy of physics of closed time-like curves, for instance. 
So there are models of the Einstein field equations in which, you know, often with suitably powerful rockets, I can go into my future and end up in my past, right? So my time, my, my timeline just goes in a big circle, okay? These are really weird models by and large, and there's a substantial discussion about whether these really count as possible in the philosophy of physics. And I think similar kinds of considerations apply for these examples of physical possibility in um, uh, uh, the consideration of the weak maximality thesis. We have to think very hard about what exactly we want out of physical possibility and whether we're going to count um, these kinds of models as physical, physical possibilities. Uh, but if people are interested, I strongly recommend that you go and check check out some of this stuff. Uh, it's really fascinating what's been looked at here. Good. So I want to close with a few brief remarks about what we want these theses for. So we've seen that the church cheering thesis is useful for working mathematically. There are just contexts in which, for instance, I, I don't want to give a big description of a cheering machine. I just want to give an effective procedure and from that conclude that the, the function is computable in the relevant sense. Right. But why are they philosophically interesting? And this is aside from, you know, there's a kind of obvious sense in which they're philosophically interesting. And that's that, that you know, they identify different conceptual classes for us, right? They identify, they give you an equivalence between things falling under different concepts. That's, of course, philosophically interesting. But I'm wondering if there are some philosophical things in the background that we might consider as um, especially relevant beyond the mere identification of different conceptual classes. So the first point to make is something that I touched on right at the start, and that's that plausibly the emergence of the church chairing thesis and related theses is an example where we have some kind of conceptual change and open texture uh, which I'll define in a second, um, and a, a development of concepts that can be seen as more than uh, mere analysis of a particular intuitive notion, right? Okay, so let's let's um, put this in the case of uh, computation. So we're going to say that a concept P exhibits open texture if there are possible objects X such that nothing in the established usage of P or non-linguistic facts about P uh, determines if P holds or fails to hold of X. So this this is this idea comes up in the work of um, Weizmann, and I'll give you a sort of uh, simple example. And it's an example Weizmann gives. Suppose I go into a room and I see a cat and it looks for all intents and purposes like a regular cat. And then let's assume that this cat suddenly grows to double its size in a matter of seconds. But other than that, it still behaves roughly like a cat. I mean, should we still say that this thing is going to count as, as a cat? Um, it's open at least if the concept, my concept of cat is meant to cover this case. Perhaps I want to introduce a new kind of uh, description to uh, cover this very unusual case. Slightly more topical case is the example, for instance, of um, whether or not something is living. So we've seen that uh, uh, throughout the development of uh, things like um, virology, um, that there are things that, eat, for example, viruses, that it's unclear whether our previous use of the term living, say uh, pre uh, good understanding of viruses, 
um, whether that was covered by as as living, whether viruses should be covered as living. Similarly, with the example of prions, for instance, it's unclear whether we should class those as as living or not. And it's just not the case that our previous concept covered those in a clear way, in the same way that, for instance, it covered cats as living. Now, we can put this uh, notion of open texture to work uh, with respect to the idea of computability, and this is something that uh, Stuart Shapiro does in a pair of papers. Um, so maybe you think this notion of computable in its pre-theoretic sense, uh, you know, a rough idea of just being able to um, perform some sort of procedure that yields an output, uh, exhibits open open texture of some sort may you know it just wasn't designed to cover uh, all these different kinds of possibility for instance in the case of the uh, maximality thesis now this is partially resolved by moving to the proto-theoretic notion of effectiveness so we see conceptual change um, we make decisions as to how this open texture is going to be resolved and in particular, the church turing thesis and its relatives can be seen as proposals to sharpen the notion and, re and remove some of these cases of open texture. So perhaps rather than seeing uh, the church turing thesis as an analysis of the pre-theoretic intuitive notion of computation, we should see the thesis and its relatives as ways of sharpening out different notions of computation and perhaps identifying some relations between them or proposals about how the relations between them should be cashed out um, to address this kind of open texture. Okay, a different direction we might push in is saying, look, maybe this analysis of effective computa uh, effective procedure effective computation and these the cognate theses associated with it the church turing thesis and the maximality theses maybe they're fine for one kind of idealization the kind of idealization where you say look just take as much time as you want and as much space as you want but perhaps the purpose of these theses instead of um, just talking about a very idealized kind of computation is to identify what we can really do with particular formal classes. So maybe instead of, you know, maybe these theses are as good as far as they go, but we should be looking the more kind of philosophically interesting kind of thesis is one that's more restricted, incorporates some notion of resource restriction and feasibility. Um, now we're going to look at theses of these kind in future weeks, uh, but there's definitely a, a question of what it is that we are meant to be accomplishing with the church Turing thesis and its, and, and its relatives uh, beyond just identifying um, particular uh, notions um, is that in addition things we want to do once we have those identifications in place good so just to summarize there's a really huge variety of mo motivations for church chairing style thesis lots has been written uh, it's a really interesting literature uh, and i suggest everybody read more about it it's it's uh, it's cool stuff um, but I do think that there are additional philosophical questions that we can ask. Some have begun to be addressed, um, for instance, in the work of Shapiro concerning conceptual change as to why these theses are important and what we want to use them for. So beyond this kind of standard philosophical discussion about just identifying the classes, I think there's a really important separate question of what we are trying to accomplish by assuming these theses, theses particularly in terms of the kind of um, 
uh, mathematical and logical practice that we engage in. Cool. Thanks for listening.